Um, this, is, uh, this is a little bit uh, intimidating. I'm a little nervous, I will tell you. Somebody, I was talking with Koser earlier who did this a few months ago. And, um, and she's like, why are you nervous? You talk in front of people all the time. And I think usually when I talk in front of people, they're actually here, to, they're there, the audience is there to hear somebody else, not me. Um, and I just happen to be like in the way so I can just, you know, I still got everybody's attention because they're like, I can't wait for the, for the real speaker. Um, but now I'm the real speaker, which is weird. Um, so, I, and before I start, uh, I learned this from the, the high school debaters last week. There's a whole bunch of people to thank. I'm not gonna do the whole, like they went on really long, anybody who, who watched the high school debates. Um, the high school debate championship last week. They, they, they really have a lot of people to thank. It's like the Oscars. Um, but seriously, uh, can we just give a huge round of applause for Spaces for hosting us and Christina? Um, Christina, the, the new space is wonderful. As I said to you earlier, it feels like a gallery. Congratulations on that. Um, but in all seriousness, this art is, uh, the art that you guys are putting together and presenting is incredibly relevant and incredibly meaningful. And, um, and I thank you for all the work that you're leading. So thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and thanks to everybody who's involved today. I know that in your program, there's about like 16 to 20 people who were involved in, in getting food here and, and doing design work and all of that. It's a really nice to, it's just really nice. So um, I think that the way that these things often begin is with um, something like this, which is like from the Oxford English Dictionary. I have one at home. There are a few that you can, that you can actually, that one could actually afford if you find them on, uh, you know, online. You can get the compact or the concise. The concise is like abridged. I have the compact. It's all very small, so I can't even read it. I had to use my phone to really expand it. Um, the more important part, though, is this part here. Um, this definition to to forbid or what does it say to forbid or debar by personal or social influence the use practice or mention of or contact or intercourse with to put a person thing name or subject under a social ban to ostracize or boycott that's taboo that's kind of the definition that we're thinking about and the definition that's really at play in um, when we think about public discourse and political discourse and the conversations that we have and the conversations we don't want to have. Um, and it's, you know, to my mind, um, I think a lot of us are guilty of sort of placing certain ideas under taboo. But to do that is, you know, I think it's kind of un-American, actually. Um, the text of the First Amendment, this is like a, a, a Bill of Rights and, and like constitutional convention here today with the 13th Amendment around us and, um, and talking about the First Amendment. The, the First Amendment covers a lot of things. We've been thinking about it. I think a lot of us have been thinking about it a lot in, uh, since November 8th um, as like, and also kind of during the election as well, but really, as the president sort of expressed that there was, you know, that there would be a ban on Muslims. And we all started thinking like, wait, that's, that, I'm pretty sure that's not constitutional. Let's just double check. Um, but uh, the, um, but, and also in this, um, I mean, the other thing I had sent to Thomas was, you know, in, like if you want to say things about, you know, who I am before, I, I'm an avowed member of the opposition party in that I'm a member of the media. I believe in the freedom of the press. And if the press is the opposition party, then like count me in. If there's going to be a Muslim registry, I will be the first Jew on the list. Um, so anyway, the First Amendment, I think we're all familiar with it, but it's a good idea to just remind yourself of what the text is and why that's important. There was a case in the beginning of the, um, in the, you know, it got cut off at the bottom there, I apologize. It says United States versus Schwimmer from the early part of the 20th century, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Schwimmer, uh, Rasika Schwimmer was um, a woman who was seeking naturalization to the United States. She wanted to become a citizen. Part of the natural, I didn't realize this, part of the naturalization process means that you have to declare that you are willing to take up arms to protect the United States of America, to take up arms against foreign enemies. And, um, and she's a pacifist. And she said, I, 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 I can't do that. I still want to be a US citizen, because I believe in all the things that US citizens believe in, but I wouldn't take up arms because I'm a pacifist. This case wound up going all the way to the Supreme Court, and uh, the Supreme Court decided against her and said, no, I'm sorry, you can't be a citizen. Um, just for, uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes dissented in that opinion. And there's a very famous kind of thing that he, that he said. He was talking about the, the word attachment here refers to like attaching these principles to the case and to her argument. and um, and 
you know, that it, the principle of free thought, not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Um, so at the beginning of the 20th century, a sort of hateful idea would be that you wouldn't take up arms against our enemies, that you would somehow want, want to be a pacifist. That, that was a, a hateful thought to at least, you know, four members, five members of the, uh, of the, of the court, um, and to a lot of people. But the question then, um, the question, you know, when you think about freedom of speech, when I think about freedom of speech, what is the thought that we hate? What is the thought that you hate? And it's tough. I mean, it's a really, when you, th all of us have strongly held opinions. And those of us who, who work in this field of civic engagement and all of that, I mean, we, like my, I feel like part of my job is to be informed and to have an opinion. And then also to take my opinion and put it aside so that I can program in the best interest. And Stephanie Jansky, my colleague, is here as well. She does far more of the programming than I do. Um, but we think about that a lot. You know, what is the, the idea that's not being represented? What is the idea that people don't want to hear but need to be exposed to? What is, the, um, what is the thing that is going to make people angry with us if we present it at the city club? We think about that a lot and we actually, we, we program specifically with that in mind sometimes. Um, free speech isn't just for um, pussy-hatted women or the Standing Rock Sioux. Um, it's also for this guy. Do you know who this guy is? Is anybody, anybody familiar with the name Richard Spencer? He took one on the chin not too long ago. Um, he, uh, yeah, he's an, an avowed, I, I don't know if he describes himself as a white nationalist or an alt-right enthusiast or whatever, but um, he, uh, shortly, after the, shortly after the election of Donald Trump, there, he was speaking at a very relatively small convention. I think there were fewer people at the convention than there are in this room right now um, of his, his organization. And they were saying, they were, they were doing this and saying, hail Trump. Um, so it's also for guys like that. It's also for guys like that and groups like that. I don't know if you can make that out. That is a Klansman. Um, as well as, of course, for Black Lives Matter. And there are people all over the political spectrum who could pick any one of these people and say that they, they shouldn't be allowed to speak. Um, and that's, to my mind, that's un-American. To my mind, what makes us uh, one of the bedrock principles of our nation is this freedom of discourse, this freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of peaceable assembly, you know, the, the right to, to, to protest and the right to seek, uh, to seek another outcome, the right to bring it to a court of law, the right to speak in front of a group of people about ideas that others may not like. This is really important and it goes, it is really part of our founding. And it was worse. I mean, frankly, I, I don't know. I recently, as, this is funny, total aside, after the election, I was like, I can't read the news right now. I'm going to read history. And I was thinking, my thinking was, <laughs> my thinking was, I'm going to go back. I was really into Alexander Hamilton. I've been like, not going to throw away my shot. You know, like all that stuff. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and my, my kids and I, we can do the entire musical. Um, but, but so I was like, okay, I'm going to read the Hamilton biography, and that's going to tell me about the founding of our country, and then I'm going to feel so much uh, better about the, you know, about how solid our democracy is and all of that. And I started to read, and I was like, oh my God, we are in so much trouble, um, because the the democracy that we have is not something that is completely solid. It is not. It is. A, it's almost a fluke that we have it. Um, the Founding fathers, I mean, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton could not have hated each other more. They were serving inside the same cabinet. So imagine if, like, uh, if Steve Bannon and, and Reince Priebus, who actually don't really like each other, but were, um, it's actually really similar because they do kind of go after each other in the press and they, and Kellyanne Conway is saying something that Steve Bannon's saying, that, that contradicts what Steve Bannon's saying, and everybody's trying to use the press to influence the executive. Um, but it was really, really bad then. And somehow our nation has, has persisted, but it's not, um, it's not a given. It's not a given that our democracy will survive. It's just not. And that was like, that was so deeply troubling to me. I was, I was like, no, this is not what history was gonna teach me. History was gonna teach me that it's all gonna be okay. And that's not the case. Okay. Um, I think most of you know who this is. It's Rex Tillerson. He's our Secretary of State. Rex Tillerson, uh, when he spoke at the City Club of Cleveland in 2013, uh, just a couple of months after I took over there, was the CEO of ExxonMobil. 
He'd been the CEO of ExxonMobil for a long time. And he, um, ExxonMobil, uh, as many of you probably know, in the 80s began doing climate science. And they, um, they discovered in the 80s that in fact, um, carbon and, and human activity was probably contributing to global climate change. And they were a little bit concerned about it, but they took their research and they were like, you know what, might not be so good for profits, let's just hide that over here. And, um, and they didn't publicize their research at all. Um, and then as the, the, the conversation, the global conversation, the national conversation around climate change um, began to take root, they were basically doing, playing both sides. They were continuing to do climate science research and they were also um, putting dollars behind the people who were essentially climate change skeptics or deniers or however you want to put that. Um, and basically saying, you know what, it's not for us to decide, it's not for us to figure this out, blah, blah, blah. So this is, this really, um, this angered a lot of people. So when Rex Tillerson was on our schedule, we started to get emails from people like, how can you have that guy speak? Rah! I'm like, was he a CEO of ExxonMobil? So I, my, my, my thinking on a lot of this is like, it's not, um, we're not going to deny people the platform because somebody doesn't like their point of view. In fact, if you email me and, and start telling me that like, I really don't like that person, they should, how can you, how dare you? Um, that's just going to make Stephanie and I, we're just going to be like high-fiving in the office um, because cause that means that that person really probably should have an opportunity. And my response to that is always the same thing. This happens on Facebook all the time. My response is always, I hope you'll come. Let me know if, you can, if you'd like me to give you a free ticket. You can have the first question. I want you to be in the audience and challenge this person. So what happened at this event, it was fantastic. It was like this beautiful city club moment. Hands up if you know David Beach of Green City Blue Lake, right? So more of you should know David Beach because he's like, but for him, we wouldn't have that, that whole notion, like when you, when you hear people talk about a green city on a blue lake, like thank David Beach. So um, David was in the audience and he stands up and he was the only person in the audience, I think, who knew what ExxonMobil had been doing with respect to uh, doing their own climate science, just really understanding very clearly that climate science is, is that climate change is caused by humans. And so he asked that question. He basically said, how can you play both sides of this? Why don't you just follow the advice of your scientists and get out of this hole and, you know, and, and support moving to like, policies that would actually counteract climate change? And it was, it was a perfect city club moment where the guy in power gets asked the question that he really doesn't want to be asked. It was like when George W. Bush spoke in 2006 and Stanley Edelstein, God bless him, um, asked him, you know, there are so many lies that led up to the, the war in Iraq, so how can we trust you now? And, and Bush was like, uh, I, 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 well, I, uh, you know. <laughs> or, or when Jan Roller asked, asked him about the, the book American Theocracy, and I can't recall the whole thing that, but that really set him back. Um, Jason Riley, um, spoke at, uh, at the City Club as well. I feel like I need to point the screen back over that way too. Trust me that um, Jason Riley is on this image. Um, Jason Riley, uh, African American who used to be on the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal and, um, and now works uh, as a sort of scholar or researcher, you know, whatever they call him at the Manhattan Institute. If you know anything about the Manhattan Institute, you know that they, they take some pretty hard right positions on things. And um, Manhattan Institute recently had a report out that said that, um, you know, that sort of suggested that, uh, that cops are being killed, you know, more. It was, it was something just very counterintuitive if you've been paying attention to the press. At any rate, Jason Riley has this book called Please Stop Helping Us. And it's essentially um, why, like, his argument is that the, the, all the policies and programs out of the Great Society, um, Lyndon B. Johnson, civil rights era kind of legislation, have not helped the, the black underclass at all. And that the black underclass, as he refers to it, would be better off if government stopped helping, like without food stamps, without, without all these anti-poverty programs. He says the anti-poverty programs haven't really done the work to lift people out of poverty. He's um, wicked smart. He's got numbers to back up his claims. Um, there's an argument and a debate to be had. He's influential. He was on the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, there were, and there were folks in the community who were asking us to have him come and talk. People really hated it. And we didn't sell a whole lot of tickets, too, which was interesting. Um, but people really disliked it. And, um, but the people who came challenged him. And there was a really robust dialogue. 
But I'll tell you, this happens not just, um, not just with speakers on the right, but also speakers on the left. This is Nora Arakat. Um, Nora Arakat, uh, her f she's a professor at George Mason University, a tenured professor at George Mason, and a Palestinian American. And she was talking about, um, about the point of view uh, that Palestinians have on the conflict between um, Israelis and Palestinians and around the West Bank and Gaza and so forth. And at one point in her talk, she was sort of explaining and explaining the, you know, really like why the Palestinian, why the behavior of Hamas could be seen as rational. Um, I had a group of guys in the back of the room. There's a, and if you've come to city club things, uh, especially on, on Fridays, every Friday there's a table full of, uh, full of guys um, who, who are, are, we call them the regulars. Um, they show up every week. Um, they are all, they're these great, great group of guys from the east side, a bunch of retired Jews and one woman. Um, and, um, <laughs> and they are, uh, and they're wonderful, um, but when it comes to certain issues, they don't have a whole lot of tolerance for different points of view. Andrew, were you in the room at this one? Yeah. And, um, and so they, uh, they couldn't handle it. They stood up, they shouted at her, and then they left the room. And it was a real low point for me um, because I was like, well, what about freedom of speech? What about just civil discourse? What about civility? What about letting somebody just, you know, have their, you know, express their point of view and answer your questions? And, and that's what we do at the City Club, right? They could not handle it. And there's some issues that where it just, you know, some people, they lose their minds. Um, but those are the issues that we need to figure out a way to talk about. Um, this is ta Coates. Um, many of you have probably read his book, Between the World and Me. Many of you have probably read the essay, uh, The Case for Reparations, that was in Atlantic Magazine. Um, and, uh, you know, Coates is hard to deal with for a lot of people. And certainly people on the political right don't have, um, don't have much interest at all in engaging with his, his ideas. I mean, he calls white supremacy white supremacy. Um, he, 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 he lays it out very clearly. And... Um, and that's hard for people to deal with. That is also equally as, as difficult for people to deal with uh, on, the, on the right as Rex Tillerson or Jason Riley is for people on the left. And there are, you know, when, when we have people like ta Coates speaking or Reverend Al Sharpton who's coming uh, on April 4th, then I get emails from people on the other side of the issue saying, well, when are you gonna balance that out? How, or how could you have that person speak and so forth? And um, that, happens all the time, but this is, you know, this idea that, I mean, his case for reparations that, um, that white America or America generally ought to pay the descendants of slaves reparations in the same way that Germans paid the descendants of the Holocaust and survivors of the Holocaust um, and made possible the, you know, the sort of reestablishment of some wealth in the Jewish community, in the Jewish diaspora, that that ought to be done for black Americans. Um, I mean, you, you can't, you, you almost can't have that kind of, I appreciate you trying, Thomas. Thomas Fox, ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Fox. <laughs> um, but you, I mean, that conversation is almost impossible to have in some circles, but it's a really important conversation because it points to uh, some basic factual realities about the history of the United States. And many of us in the room right now would say, that's, that's a, we, should, we should totally have that conversation. We should totally be pushing for reparations, um, but try and have that conversation with Senator, you know, with any Republican Senator or even like half the Democratic Senators. They'll say, no, 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 we can't do that. That's too hard, no. And, that, and reparation, legislation to just study the possibility of reparations has been introduced every year since the mid 80s, I think, and it has never received a vote, just to study the issue. People don't wanna have the conversation, which is why we need to have the conversation. So the question then, I should've done all my slides like that. Um, <laughs> The, que <laughs> the question then is, what is the thought that you hate? Um, and how would you deal with that? How would you handle the thought that you hate, somebody presenting the thought that you hate? Um, because there are things that we don't want to deal with. There are people who we share this country, with whom we share this country, that, um, 
that believe things just vastly different than the way we see it. Um, and that's part of what makes our country great, but it's part of what makes our country right now so divided and so difficult. This is Daryl Davis. Um, Daryl Davis is a, um, is a jazz musician, blues, jazz, piano player, and he travels the country uh, performing. And his hobby on the side is seeking out members of the Ku Klux Klan and engaging them in dialogue. And his essential MO is asking them, how can you hate me when you don't know me? He's received a lot of pushback from the black community for even engaging in conversation with avowed white supremacists. And, um, but what he has at home, he has a closet full of robes that have been given to him by former Klan members who he spoke to and convinced that their racism is not the way forward. A closet full of robes. And so when he has that, when he has those conversations with members of the black community who accuse him of, of, of betraying the race because, by engaging in conversation, he's like, this is what I'm doing as an anti-racist. What are you doing? I'm converting racists to anti-racists. What are you doing? So is that, like, can you, I, I mean, before I read this, this story, like, I wouldn't have believed that was possible. But this is what he does. And it's the power of dialogue. It's the power of engagement. It's the power of of engaging directly with the most hateful thought you can imagine. Um, this happened, this is from two weeks ago or so, Charles Murray at Middlebury College. Um, God, this is Charles Murray, I swear. This is Professor Allison Stanger of Middlebury College. Um, how many of you were following this story or sort of read about it a little bit? Not enough of you, okay. So um, I'll, I'll tell you, so Charles Murray wrote a book in the 90s called The Bell Curve. It was, a, it was um, sort of, it's been accused of being like pseudo-social science. He's a political scientist, but he's really into like, um, uh, you know, he comes up theory by anecdote, essentially. And he, his theory was, he's all about like IQ tests and the bell curve suggested some, um, some really awful things about, about race and IQ. And um, as a result of that book, I mean, that came out in 1994, and he was, um, he was labeled, uh, um, he was labeled, what was he labeled exactly? This, he's on the Southern Poverty Law Center's list, basically, which is like, you know, not a list you wanna be on. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, he has another book out uh, called Coming Apart, um, it, which is essentially about how white America is coming, is, has been coming apart. And, and it looks at some of the same things he was looking at in the bell curve and making these, like, these broad, awful generalizations about black America in the bell curve. And then he was pointing out that white America in this new book, Coming Apart, which came out in 2012, he was pointing out that the, some of the same, things are ha the same things are happening in white America, joblessness among, um, among males of working age, you know, um, males of working age, white males being like really prone to, um, to just, you know, making, making up reasons to be on disability and so on and so forth. All of this stuff that, you know, is very connected to the broader narratives around the white uh, underclass and Trump and the voting patterns for Trump and all of that stuff. And so the, I think it was the college Republicans at Middlebury said we really like Charles Murray to come and speak and they asked Professor Allison Stanger to um, interview him to, to moderate the, the dialogue as well. Stanger's a Democrat but she has a great reputation on campus for being nonpartisan in her teaching and um, her daughter happened to intern on a project that I worked on, so I happened to know her, um, which is why I was paying really close attention to this, but also because it's a free speech issue. So Murray's introduced by, one of, by a student, so it's a student group, right? It's important to understand that's a student group that invited him, private college, um, but they're saying, yeah, of course, we will help, this is an, an important moment. And um, the the event was basically shut down by protesters. Protesters you know, came in, and then when Charles Murray got up to speak, every, like, more than half the room stood up, turned their backs, and started chanting. Um, and, you know, like, just slogan after slogan after slogan. They're like, okay, well, this isn't gonna work. So they decide to go to a, def a different room. This is where this, photo, this video still was grabbed. They go to a different room, and, um, 
and they're doing uh, and they're streaming it live out. But then the protesters figured out where they were. They started pulling fire alarms. They started banging on windows. And then when they leave, um, so they decide to shut the whole thing down. When on their way out, they get a t these two are walking out the door to the car. They get attacked by the protesters, physically attacked by people who don't want to even hear somebody say something they may not agree with or, or vehemently disagree with. They get attacked. Allison Stanger winds up in the hospital with a concussion, spends a week in a dark room not doing anything to recover from her concussion. And she had a neck injury as well. Um, so <laughs> that's like, that, that's really, the, that's a great example. I mean, this, a, a similar thing happened. I went to Berkeley as an undergraduate and a graduate student, and a similar thing happened when Milo Yiannopoulos was invited to speak there. Um, I don't give a crap about Milo Yiannopoulos. I think the guy, if he didn't have a British accent, nobody would pay attention to him, <laughs> honestly. Um, and I think this is gonna go up on YouTube, and maybe Milo, can we tag it Milo? Can we make sure that's in there, Thomas has it? Okay, so like, <laughs> Maybe he'll pay attention to that and I'll become his enemy. Um, but really, that guy is, if, if he's not worth paying attention to. But the thing is, if, if the protesters hadn't shown up, it wouldn't have even been a story. If, you know, like, I, and I, I, I say this about Milo, having tried to watch his appearance at, at the University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder, because I was like, well, I, I, if I'm gonna, I should know what he's saying, right? Because somebody had even suggested, hey, that guy was banned from Twitter. There's a free speech issue. You should invite him to speak at the city club. So I was like, okay, well, let me see what he says. Well, he doesn't say anything. He just sort of makes fun of people and does it with a British accent, so he sounds sort of posh. And um, it's, um, it's, it's bogus. But the problem is, the thing, that, the thing that concerns me, and Alison Stanger just wrote a very eloquent um, opinion piece in the New York Times about this, is that if we allow students or anybody to shut down free speech, even if it's speech we hate, even if it's the thought we hate, if we allow that as a, if that becomes permissible, if that becomes the norm, then we lose our ability to engage in civil discourse. We lose our ability to listen across difference. We lose our ability to have conversations that can, in which we can convince one another. We lose our essential humanity because we are no longer recognizing that people come from different points of view, that people come from different, different backgrounds that have and that inform their perspective. And we lose an essential part of our humanity in our, we lose our ability to believe that people can change their minds and people can evolve. I think it's really important. A few years ago, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, to start an award for like, like the Open Mind Award for somebody who has publicly changed their mind on an issue. Um, because it's so hard, because we're always accusing people of flip-flopping when they do that. Isn't that what we want? <sighs> About six months ago, I was invited to, an audience, to speak to an audience far more intimidating than this one. Um, it was a group of girls at Hathaway Brown. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> This is the best, best feedback I've ever gotten from a speech or any sort of public, public moment was a girl who came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, they usually, they bring us in here and it's usually pretty boring, um, but you were actually interesting. <laughs> it's like, yes. That's amazing. So they, they are engaging in a year. This started in September. So in the midst of the election, before, uh, in the midst of the campaign, but before the election, recognizing that there's a lot of different points of view at Hathaway Brown. And the leadership there said, we really want to give the girls, um, give our young women an opportunity to, and some of the tools, some tools to speak across difference, to learn across difference, to have tough conversations without getting mad and without shutting each other down. So I was invited to, to speak to them. What I did was I, I talked to them about some tools that, that I have learned through journalistic work. Um, and I'm just gonna share some of those with you really quickly because they seem germane to what we're talking about. So one of, them, one of them is to kind of approach people with a sense of humility and a sense of civility, right? So like if I'm gonna, if I know that you and I don't, don't agree on something, um, I think it's really important that if we're gonna have the conversation, that I start with that kind of kind of gratitude and humility and say like, say like, I appreciate you sharing your point of view. 
right? Starting from that place. Um, as a journalist, the, the work of journalism is incredibly parasitic when you think about it. Um, journalists go to people, usually, uh, oftentimes, when it's a really compelling story, it's because you're reaching somebody at their most vulnerable, and then you ask them to make themselves more vulnerable, and then you take credit for it in the byline. It's awful, but it's really important work too. But I mean, really at its heart, it's really, really problematic. And if you want to think more about that, I would invite you to read The Journalist and the Murderer by Janet Malcolm, who used to write for The New Yorker. Um, listen more than you talk. Um, this is really hard, um, but it is the most important thing. A lot of people, I, you know, as, as all of you know, I do a lot of interviews, uh, public interviews, and have for the last 10, 10 or 12 years, um, and people, uh, the feedback that I get, the, the reason I keep getting asked to do this is probably because people say, you always ask the question that's on my mind as well. And, um, and it's just amazing how you do that. And the answer, it's not really that amazing. I do that because I'm listening to what the, the person is saying, right? Uh, bad interviewers are using their, their list of questions as a checklist. And once they get through that checklist, they're done. But good interviewers, Terry Gross, whoever else on the radio that you listen to, they're listening and they're asking the follow-up question that's related to the resonant thing that was just said. Um, I think it's really important that we listen as much, um, as much as we can and more than we talk in these sorts of scenarios when we're, when we're trying to seek understanding across difference. Um, it's really important to be curious. Our curiosity is what helps us get past our assumptions. Our curiosity in questions like, how did you come to feel that way? Was there an experience you had that, that made you think about that? That's a really, really, those are really important questions. So approaching these, op these as learning opportunities for yourself, that, I mean, that's what I try to do. And it's not like, I mean, I say this and it's not like it's easy. It's not like, I mean, family reunions are like the worst. And because you, you inevitably get into a conversation with like that person in your family who really like sees things a certain way and you're like, okay, let's do this. And you like roll up your sleeves, you like grab another beer, and you're like, okay. And like, and I um, like, I've lost my mind in these conversations before. But so I'm, I'm. This is as much a reminder for me as anybody else. Um, this is my attempt to uh, draw something that says, examine your own biases. So like, cut off the top of your head, look at what's inside. Um, but <laughs> see, you'll remember it though, right? You'll remember it. You're like, oh. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> You know, it, it's really important. We all have these biases. Social science research has, you know, anybody who's been reading stuff about this understands that all of us are carrying a boatload of biases all the time. And, we may, and we're constantly, our brains are hardwired to make these, these quick assumptions about people and about things and about ideas all the time. And we have to be able to examine those and recognize when they're coming into play. And, um, and I think that's a, just really crucial. It's very important for journalists. Right, because journalists are sort of still striving towards objectivity. Um, I tend to think that transparency is probably more important than objectivity. Transparency is at least achievable. Objectivity is really not. Um, lastly, choose your words wisely. Um, a lot of times we use words that we're very comfortable with, but we don't realize that they're triggers for other people. Um, you know, this gets to the conversations around microaggressions that have become uh, very much a part of the public discourse, um, and even people who accuse those who, who, who point to microaggressions as being snowflakes have their own triggers and, their own, and are responding to other microaggressions on that side. So it's just, words matter. And so we should just be cognizant of that and be willing to put certain words aside if they you know, if, they're, if they become obstacles to understanding. So those are the five, right? I'm just gonna go back through them real quick here. Um, gratitude and civility, listening more than you talk, being curious, examining your biases, and choosing your words, um, choosing your words carefully. So, so when we think about what's taboo and why, and, and why the taboo is actually worth getting closer to. Um, this, is, this is what we stand for. I believe this is part of what we stand for as Americans, is engaging in the tough conversations. 
there's a lot of tough conversations. If you would ask me a, a year ago, kind of what are the conversations we're gonna be having in the coming year, I would have said that we would be spending a lot more time talking about racial equity um, than, you know, and it felt to me a year ago that, you know, we were sort of on this inexorable journey towards a more multicultural, more inclusive, and more diverse society, and that we were all ready to have the tough conversations around race and equity. And, um, and now that's not the case. We're not having those conversations that we need to have. Instead, we're having, um, we're, we're having conversations about why we, as a nation of immigrants, we should still continue to welcome immigrants. Why the, the establishment clause of the First Amendment really does protect freedom of religious expression. Um, it's weird and unsettling to be having, to be sort of going back to these kind of foundational questions and these foundational conversations, but apparently those are some of the conversations that we need to have. Um, so, anyway, I feel like I've depressed the hell out of all of you. That is not, <laughs> was not my intention. So I'm searching right now. I just want to, I, here's the other thing I believe though. I mean, this is, this is bedrock stuff around, um, around who we are as Americans and who we are as Clevelanders and, um, and what we stand for. The thing about, I'll, I'll just put in like sort of a quasi advertisement for the City Club. What we do at the City Club, in 1912 these people came together because they felt like there's too many problems that needed fixing and not enough opportunities for conversation across difference. The people who, who founded the original City Club were Republicans and Democrats, they were Jews and Catholics and Christians, they were black and they were white, although, Real, honestly, they were mostly white. That's, yeah, it was 1912. Um, and they were all men. Okay, that was 1912. Um, nevertheless, they, um, they understood that conversation is the, way that, is the way that you can get change started. And conversation is a way that you can build a stronger community. That's part of our DNA as Clevelanders. The City Club is sort of the place where a lot of that happens, but it happens in so many other places as well and through the work of so many other institutions, spaces, creative mornings, et cetera. Um, you all are a part of that. You're doing that already. It's really hard sometimes, but don't be afraid of the really tough conversations, no matter what the tough conversation is. This is what we do, and we are actually pretty good at it. It's just that it's really, really hard. So, um, so lastly, I would just like to say thank you, and um, I, you won't be able to see this, but these are the photo credits. Um, okay. You were right. That was awesome. Okay, thank you. We have, we have like maybe five to ten minutes for questions if anybody would like to ask Dan the hard questions. Who's going, you're, who's calling, you're, 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 you're first. Okay. I was wondering since, um, for your history of working with the City Club, what's the, um, the most talk that really aggravated you that even you had to control yourself and, and force yourself to listen? Um, what, was, what talk was the most aggravating for me personally where I thought my own brain was gonna explode? Um, God, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I get into a place there where I just want to learn and, and soak it up. Um, and, you know, I, Jason Riley was one that really challenged a lot of my assumptions about what's right and what works in the world. Um, so it wasn't the kind of thing that was making my brain explode, but it was really, um, it was one where I felt like I need to understand all of these issues a lot more, a lot better, because he was sort of, you know, I have a narrative in my head about civil rights and the great, great society legislation and all of that stuff and equality. And he was saying, no, it hasn't worked. If it, was, if it had worked, we wouldn't have so many people in poverty right now, right? If it had worked, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have these terrible education outcomes. And, you know, and I don't know, I need to learn more. I mean, my, my gut says, now the time frame is too short. You're talking about you know, 40 to 50 years of legislation to counteract the previous 350 years of subjugation. But I don't know. So yeah, in the back, sir. Okay, speak loudly, stand up so everybody can hear you. Yes, yes, I'm David Duke is not coming to the city club. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah. And lastly is, do you think it's fair to characterize the current inhabitant in the White House as a fascist when he declares the press an enemy of the people? 
No, I don't think it's fair to declare him as a fascist. I don't think he's a fascist. Um, you know, here's, here's some interesting things about, about Donald Trump, right? Um, Donald Trump and Sherrod Brown align on trade policy. <laughs> Donald Trump and Sherrod Brown both want to dismantle NAFTA. They both think that NAFTA has not worked for the American worker and would remake it in probably very similar ways. Just, I know like 110% of you voted for Sherrod Brown the last time you had an opportunity. So um, just grapple with that for a second. Um, you know, and, and Donald Trump, you know, there are, you know, Donald Trump may be the president who brings in a federal law requiring family medical leave, you know, family leave that actually like, you know, pays for maternity leave. He may be the guy who does that thanks to his daughter. You know, what will the left do then? Um, I don't think Donald Trump is organized enough to be a fascist, frankly. Fascists, <laughs> fascists as we know, uh, make the trains run on time. Um, so, yeah, um, I think they're, yeah. I don't think, but, but beyond that, I just don't think that's an, an, an appropriate label for him. Um, now, but to your other point though, the question is, right, like, so David Duke is not coming, but would Steve Bannon be welcome at the City Club of Cleveland, right? So Steve Bannon, um, at, at a certain point, because we are who we are, with a commitment to not only the Constitution, but also the institutions that the Constitution governs. That means that in spite of what Steve Bannon has stood for in the past, right now he's a representative of the White House and the executive branch. And if, if we were to get a phone call from the White House, and these sorts of things happen sometimes, right? If we were to get a phone call and say, Steve Bannon would like to come and speak at the White House, although it wouldn't be that, it would be like a cabinet, a cabinet member at the highest level like this little dog. Um, <laughs> um, we would say yes, right? If Kellyanne Conway wanted to speak at the City Club of Cleveland, we would say yes. And that is because the office that these people occupy is greater than who they are as individuals, I think. And for that reason, we, I, I think that's probably how that would happen sort of philosophically, if you know what I mean. Um, but there is a line, you know, the, the First Amendment, to be clear, does not draw a line at hate speech. The First Amendment protects the Klan, and it protects racists and neo-Nazis and fascists and white supremacists. Um, we don't, that doesn't mean that we have to offer them a platform. Our, our job, our mission is to create conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. So that's our, um, if it's not gonna help democracy thrive, I'm not sure that our board would say we need to give them a platform. But in 19, what was it, 2021, when Eugene Debs was invited to the city club, it almost tore apart the city club because there were board members who did not want Debs to speak. And then Debs was like, oh, well, I don't wanna tear apart your organization, so I just won't come. Um, which, it was a real low point for the city club, frankly. Other questions? Christina. Have you ever regretted the way that you mediated a conversation with Congress? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Many times. Um, so when you're, when, you're, when you're publicly moderating a conversation, I think that's what you're talking about, like moments when I've been on stage. Yeah, when you're publicly moderating a conversation, there's no safety net and you just have to do what you do. And um, a couple of years ago, we, I was moderating a political debate between Dave Joyce, Michael Wager, and um, what's his name? What was the, um, the libertarian candidate, uh, David Macko, um, for the f 14th Congressional District um, and uh, for the general election. David Macko had a history of, um, of publicly uh, using hate speech, and so that's why I chose to moderate that one. I said, if anybody has to shut him down, I'll shut him down. Well, that wasn't the real concern. What happened was that I asked Dave Joyce a question about how he would change Obamacare, you know, sort of taking that philosophy that, like, the legislator's job is to legislate, repeal and replace was not gonna happen in 2014, um, so how would you fix it? Right, which is now, of course, what everybody's doing is like they're repairing it. Um, 
And he didn't answer the question. And so I asked him again, and then he didn't answer the question. I said, okay, sir, you haven't answered the question twice. I'll, I'll ask it one more time. And I got into so much trouble for having done that. Um, and I regret having asked the third time. I don't regret having pointed out that he didn't answer the question the first time, but, um, but I shouldn't have gone back for, uh, I shouldn't have taken another bite at that apple. Um, that's one example. There's pro I could probably come up with 18 others um, where I haven't been as ready for the conversation as I, as I wish, or I haven't challenged somebody as forcefully as I should have. Um, but yeah, yes. Yes. And that there are no uh, facts. Right. No alternative facts. And there's right. also some research to show that the more you show somebody facts and figures, the more they entrench. Yes. So I, it feels like beating your head against a wall sometimes as a facts and figures statistics type person. Mm -hmm. um, Well, I, you know, ultimately, it, it, ultimately conversations, these kinds of conversations are emotional conversations. They're not logical conversations. And I think it's important to sort of approach them with that kind of recognition. Um, I'm not good at this necessarily, and I don't have all, all the answers, but I, but I do think it's important to recognize that people's, the, the types of things you're talking about have to do more with the people's emotions than it does with the actual truth of the matter. That said, I think when people are talking about their facts and your facts and, and different sets of facts, what they're actually talking about are different ways in which statistics can be interpreted, different ways in which you could, you could and you've seen this, right? Polling is a great example, right? The same raw poll numbers were given to five different pollsters in, the, in, in like September or October. I think the New York Times did this on the upshot. And, and those five pollsters came up with different, wildly different interpretations of the very same numbers, the very same raw data. Because, I don't know if you're a mathematician or a statistician or have, or have worked with that, you, you can like load certain variables, certain factors, you can look at certain things, you can weight, weight different things, and, and they come up differently. And if you're looking for something, it's like the confirmation bias exists when you're looking at facts. So I think when people say there are alternative, I don't, Kellyanne Conway was talking about, was doing her thing, but when people are saying like, well, you've got your facts, I've got my facts, I think that's what they're really saying. You've got your Heritage Foundation study and I've got my Center for American Progress study, right? Which one is right? Yeah, so I, I think it's, it comes down to emotions too. You, the, the real, the real, answer to a lot of this comes down to like people's emotions and that's sort of what you see now with this budget that's just come out people are saying okay like really that's what we stand for we're going to take away meals on wheels like that's that's the answer to the deficit okay like and I don't think that people actually I mean that's I, I don't think that's going to work I don't think it's going to work in Congress so it may not have to require you know the rest of America to stand up but we'll see uh, one more well, last last question you've got your hand up okay Mm -hmm. Right. There's, a, there's an echo chamber on both sides. Yes. Um, is there uh, activity to try and <laughs> merge the streams? Um, uh, You've got to do that for yourself. Uh, of course. You know, like, honestly, there's no... Um, I mean, I think that, uh, that public radio happens to do, despite its reputation, happens to do a very good job at this. They, if, you, if you listen closely, I mean, this morning I was listening to one of Donald Trump's closest friends, the editor-in-chief of Newsmax, um, being interviewed by Steve Inskeep. And that's, you know, like, there you go. There, there are the streams merging right there, right? They've had people from InfoWars on. They've had, you know, they, um, and, you know, and even... Frankly, Fox News, I think Fox News may do a better job of actually mixing it up than MSNBC does. 
in terms of representing other points of view on um, on their own on their own channel. But I do think, I mean, the, here's the reality, like we complain about it all the time. We complain about Facebook's algorithms. We complain about all this. Well, you know what? Like it's on your computer. If you want, to, if you want exposure to these other things, like you can get it. It's never been easier, right? You don't need a, a satellite dish in your backyard to get this alternative news or whatever. I mean, like it's on your phone. So, you know, subscribe to updates from Fox News through your iPhone news app, and then, you know, and then you'll know. Um, you know, you can, read, you can read Breitbart through the news app, through your iPhone news app. I mean, you, you, it's not hard to get that stuff. It's, um, it can be hard to actually engage with it. Um, it can be, you know, it can be hard to, to, to want to do that, but I think it's an interesting sort of thought experiment or actual experiment to, you know, see how much of the other side's point of view can I tolerate and how much can I understand. Um, but, yeah, thank you for these questions. Thank you all for being here today. You're a beautiful, beautiful group of people. Dan Maldrup, you're the best. Sorry about the... There's, we can hang out for as long as you guys want to hang out. Is that right, Christina? Do we have to go anywhere? She says, sure, we can hang out. There's more, what? Roll, yeah, we're gonna roll the kegs in, head to the parade, it'll be a good time. Thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see you soon.